Shanti and good evening. I can imagine that there's a lot going on outside there. Coronation parties and I don't know what else. And it's a beautiful spring evening, so I'm very glad that all of you made the choice to be here today. Usually we hear about, or we used to, hear a lot about IQ, intelligence quotient. And sometime much later, because they started measuring IQ, I think, at the start of the 20th century, somewhere around there. And towards the end of the 20th century, it became clear that IQ wasn't really enough. There were other things that had to be seen in terms of how a person actually works in life. And where there were headhunters, they then began to look for an added dimension. And that was EQ, emotional intelligence, emotional quotient. And the difference is that with IQ, I deal with all the logistics of this physical dimension. And so length, width, breadth, height, statistics, all of those things that we can measure. And then they began to realize that a person can have very, very high IQ, but put them in charge of people and something goes wrong. Things don't work out as they should. Very high intelligence, they know everything, they can manage everything to do with stats, but they weren't quite able to manage relationships. And so they began to understand that EQ was a subject of emotional intelligence, and so it was important to be able to look at that dimension also. And yes, it is important, but in fact, the foundation of EQ is actually SQ, the spiritual intelligence and the quotient of that. And that took, again, many years for people to come to start looking at that dimension. And if I were to try and specify SQ, then in one word it would be self-realization, and with that, self-actualization. And so, it's good to have good relationships, but it actually depends on how well I know myself and to the extent that I know myself and I know what's going on in terms of my own inner world, my emotions, my feelings, my perceptions, my reactions, what's going on with all of this, then I can learn also to manage first myself and then I can learn to manage relationships. I'm not managing the other, but I'm managing myself within relationships, which is the only thing I can actually do. Because have you ever tried to control someone else? What happens? <laughs> things fall flat or things break down. Very often they just break down. But if I understand myself and learn to manage myself, then can start managing my side of a relationship in the best way possible and it's more than likely that the relationship is going to be able to flourish even if one partner knows what's going on inside of themselves and they're able to manage their response then making sure that it's a pure positive elevated response then of course at some point of time, hopefully sooner rather than later, but at some point, then the response from the other is also likely to change. And even if it doesn't immediately change, even if it seems it's going on forever, it's taking a long, long time, it's okay, because at least I'm managing myself, and so I'm able to create an equilibrium within myself in which there aren't reactions happening, but there's a balanced understanding and a balanced response. 
And so in fact, the pyramid actually works the other way, starting with spiritual intelligence, and then on the basis of that, emotional intelligence, and on the basis of that, even IQ. And of course, in a world that's topsy-turvy in many different ways, we've got that topsy-turvy too. We start from the outside, and sometimes you stay on the outside, but sometimes we start on the outside and gradually begin to go on that inner journey. But going that way takes a very long time. But if I can begin with spiritual intelligence, that actually speeds up the journey incredibly. So I was lucky I started my spiritual journey early on. But at whatever time of our life we begin that journey, it's always going to be bringing very positive results and be very helpful for each one in their life. I've just mentioned knowing the self very briefly. But think about it further. And when I begin to know myself, one of the most beautiful things that begins to happen is that getting to know myself means that I begin to value myself. If I spend time with you, I'm more likely to get to know you and more likely to value you as an individual, not just a face amongst a thousand others, but you as an individual. So how well do I know myself? It's a journey. <laughs> and when I started my journey, I thought I did know myself. And as I went along, I realized that there were lots of layers and layers and layers. And it's gradually peeling off those layers and coming back to the essence of who I truly am. And so one is to know myself. And when I know myself, and I begin to value myself, and I begin to have a state of self-esteem, self-respect, then the outcome of that is that I also recognize the value of each and everyone else. And of course, when you see others with that awareness of their value, and you respect them, and you treat them with the dignity that they deserve, then in that situation, because you are putting out respect, then at some point, they begin to respect you also. Very often we start off by saying, well, no one loves me, no one respects me, and we either go into a shell or we go into extra overactive drive in which then we're bossy and controlling and trying to manage others instead of managing ourselves. And so again, things go drastically wrong. But building up my own state of self-esteem and valuing who I am and my own specialities means that when I see you and I value you and I see you with that dignity, then I'm more likely to be able to reach out to you and engage with you with respect so that then we're developing a healthy relationship. And this applies to any type of relationship whether at home, whether at work, or whether it's social engagement, whatever it may be. But it makes such a huge difference to come from a point of stability inside. If I'm not stable inside, and I'm expecting something from you to give me stability, well, it might work for a week, it might work for a few months, but certainly it isn't going to last forever because there's no way that another person can be supporting me all the time, always, forever. It's just never going to happen because they go through their ups and downs, they go through their mood swings, they go through their challenges, and it's not possible to find any outside anchor in that way. 
and the impossible dream is to think that there can be somebody out there who can be that support for me forever at all times. It's just not going to happen. And so to build up my own self-esteem so that I'm not in that state of dependency is so very important, especially in times of uncertainty and all the challenging things that the world is facing at the present time. It's been a lovely weekend because we've been in a state of euphoria and it was a very beautiful ceremony to watch yesterday. Very moving, very sacred and in a world in which the word God is very rarely mentioned it was beautiful to have two hours in which God played a central role. <laughs> it really was fascinating to see that. And how often do you hear the word God on the media? Except in the religious sermons or the religious programs, the God slot once a week. And not many people watch the God slot. And so, in a way, it was like a breath of fresh air to have everything so centered around God. That's another story, <laughs> but I'm just thinking that it's a very good time to be talking about the subject of the self, because in SQ, one of the things that we learn is that it's possible to become a self-sovereign. None of us are ever going to sit on the throne that King Charles has, but each and every one of us can sit on this inner throne and be a sovereign of the self and have that mastery over our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions and the way in which we respond to other people and other situations. And so that is self-mastery, self-sovereignty, which is more important than any other throne that the world can offer. Because it means that Truly, no one can take away your dignity. No one needs to give you anything to make you aware of your own value. And this has nothing to do with ego. In fact, it's totally the opposite. In that state in which I have truly my own value for myself, there's also actually a great humility, a great respect for others because one knows that each and every individual is unique and so each and every individual has value and it's true no two human beings have the same features not even twins at first twins seem to be the same and when you get to know them you begin to see all the little differences that are there facially not just in terms of character but you can also begin to recognize each one individually and even more so in terms of personality. Each one's personality is absolutely unique, really no two individuals the same. Why? Because no two individuals have been on the same journey of life. Every single one has had a different experience. We may have been in the same situation, but yet our experience of that situation is very different. I know that some people saw the program, the coronation yesterday, and their comment was it was boring. And it's true, it, it didn't have that excitement and razzmatazz and all of that until right to the end when there was a parade of 4,000 people. But it wasn't meant to be razzmatazz, it was meant to be a very sacred occasion and that came across very beautifully. So, perception. Somebody says it's boring and somebody says it's profound and it's the same event that they're talking about. They're not talking about two separate events but perceptions can be literally 180 degrees different and so each one's personality unique and very different but the more I get to understand my personality 
and the hills and the valleys of my own personality. What are my ups? What are my downs? What is it that triggers my downs? What is it that is a stimulus for my ups? The more I get to know myself, the more I can manage myself in the best possible way. This is to be a self-sovereign. Maybe I can't manage my job in the sense that this is the job I'm supposed to do and I do my little bit, whatever it is I can. And then there are lots of things happening around me, but neither do I have the responsibility nor the capacity nor the remit to be able to do anything about those other things. So if I'm not content with that, let me find a way to move out and do something that is satisfying and makes me content. But external things are never going to be 100% to my liking. Have you been in situations in which the external is fulfilling, fulfilling all your expectations and it ticks all the boxes? It doesn't happen most of the time. And if it happens once in a while, that's amazing. But most of the time, it's okay. The situation's not as I would have wanted it, but it's okay, I can manage it. But so long as my inner world is in a state of balance, in a state of calm and peace and clarity and love and truth, that's enough, that's good. Then I'll be able to manage things externally much, much better also. And so, SQ means to know myself, to know my weaknesses, and to know my strengths, so that I'm using my strengths more and more, so that they develop and are enhanced further, but also I'm able to see my weaknesses, and I don't get desperate, I don't get hopeless, I don't feel guilt, they're there, and that's also part of me. But I can find the spiritual tools with which to be able to change those weaknesses and come out the other side so that I can have a state of being in which I'm complete. I think that's possible. Why? Because I've had the good fortune of being with individuals who I see as being very together and very whole and complete. I remember traveling with Daddy Janki from London to Scotland by car. We'd gone to Edinburgh, and Daddy always much preferred to go by car because then she was a master of her time instead of having to be on the dot punctual for a train and some things have to get missed out. And Daddy was always very spontaneous. So we'd arrived and it was November time. And so the journey at the start was very pleasant, but as we got further and further north, it became muggy and cloudy and finally rainy. And we arrived at the center, and there was a, a, a whole team waiting for us. And these were people who were doing biometrics, and in a very specific way. Um, they did um, Curlian photography. Who's aware of Curlian photography? A few. So they were measuring energy levels, and Dadi by then had a cough. And she had a cough 70% of the time, I would say. Um, and now the weather and the journey, she was tired, and so it, uh, it had brought on the cough. And so the team said that um, they wouldn't get optimum results, and so would she like them to come back the next day or the next day? And it would have been difficult fitting in the time for that. That evening was allocated for them. So that he said, it's okay, we'll, I'll manage. And so just after a hot drink and so on, she settled down and they measured just her thumb. But usually the measurements of the thumb were such that the energy around the thumb was an indicator of the energy of the whole body. But the energy around very, very rarely was a complete form. Usually it had 
rough edges to it, jagged edges. Um, and so they were very surprised that the energies that she was radiating had this complete form without any jagged edges or anything like that. And they were even more surprised because she was tired and that should have impacted the energy. Um, she had a cough, that should have impacted it. But what they saw was like a complete circle around her thumb. And they were surprised and they said that, well, it's an indication of the energy she's radiating, that there is this completion, a total complete energy. And it's an indication of what happens if you know yourself through your own inner journey and your own inner work. Um, I'm talking about this happening at the end of the 80s, somewhere around there. And these things were fairly new at that time. Kalyan photography has now been superseded by all sorts of other machines and devices that measure energies on other more sophisticated levels. And that happened a lot with Adi also. She became the subject of many, many experiments later on too. But at that time, it was very interesting to see how she had already been meditating for about 50 years by then. And so 50 years of meditation meant that whatever were the levels of physical energy, the tiredness and so on, or whatever were the ups and downs of physical health with a cough and so on, uh, it didn't make a jot of difference to her spiritual level of energy. And so it's possible for us to attain the same state. And the method she used was simply the things that I'm talking about which come under the banner of Raj Yoga. Yoga, the union with the divine, and Raja, the king, the sovereign, the master. And so, yoga through which I attain self-mastery. But also, the yoga that I'm having with the one who is the supreme, the divine. Both translations of Raj Yoga would be correct. And in this case, Yes, if I want to come to that state of dignity, self-esteem, a stable state of love, a stable state of joy that's there within me, an anchor for myself, an anchor for others, then definitely meditation, and in particular Raj Yoga meditation, I've seen actually brings about those results. What happens through all of this? Well, the first step is understanding, to understand where my emotions and feelings are coming from. And they're actually coming from my thoughts. And it's strange, but most times, we're not in charge of our thoughts. Thoughts seem to come to us from here and there and everywhere, but no. My responses to all the things coming to me from here and there, but that's not the cause of my thoughts or my feelings. Something is being triggered within myself to generate those thoughts and feelings. And we would say that it's patterns of behavior that have been coded within the self. And over a period of time, those patterns are set in such a way that the trigger comes and it's the same response each time. And so somebody's late. And your response has been set in such a way that you get irritated. And if they're even later still, you get more irritated until you get to the point where it's really not just irritation, it's actually anger. And every time that situation comes about, that's it. Your response is going to be of anger. And that is going to continue until there's a moment in which we change something within ourselves in a conscious way. And so this autopilot is going to carry on. 
while I continue in the same consciousness. And the change that happens is when I shift my awareness in a very, very specific way, thinking of myself with a physical identity. I've been told I'm a girl, I'm a woman, and I carry on thinking in that way till the end of my days. And I'll be responding in the same way, autopilot, without any conscious thought behind it. The trigger comes and that will be my response. And if I want to continue like that, that's fine. But if I decide I want to change something, then spiritual intelligence says, understand the self and change the awareness of identity. This is just the physical chariot that I use. And the inner being, the being that is actually conscious and is consciousness, is the invisible being that's actually making things happen. My hand moves, but there's a signal coming. But there are lots of experiments that indicate that the hand is moving not just because of the physical brain, but there's something else apart from the brain, consciousness, awareness, and call it spirit, call it soul, call it the inner being, whatever term you're comfortable with. But it's this inner being that is responsible for making everything happen. My eyes see, but my eyes don't make sense of what I'm seeing. A classic example always given in India is that I see something long and thin and it's brown. Now what is it? And if my past experience has been that something long and thin and brown is a piece of string, I'll think, well, what's a string, piece of string doing there? And I'll go to pick it up and I might get a shock because my experience has never been that that piece of string is not a piece of string, it's actually a snake. For whatever I've been programmed to believe and think, that's what I see. My eyes see, but the sense of my brain and behind the brain, the awareness, the consciousness is my own experience. And of course, if I'm used to snakes, then it may be a piece of string. But my first thought is that or maybe it's a snake, and so I'll be extra cautious in approaching it. So whatever our experiences have been, that's recorded within the inner being, and that is determining the knowledge, the information that I make of what my eyes see, or the sound that I hear. At one moment you're hearing a sound and it's mumbo-jumbo. And a few weeks, months of study, and that same mumbo-jumbo is no longer that. It's a language. And I'm making sense of it. And I'm now comprehending it. Now I'm understanding it. So it's not the ears. It's the consciousness, the awareness within that's making sense of all of this. So. This inner being, which is not physical, not visible to the human eye, but yet is real. And it is this being that is creating thoughts, creating feelings, creating emotions on the basis of understanding and past experience. And so when that understanding switches away from just the physical form to the inner being, and I remember that, and something starts to trigger feelings and emotions, I remind myself, well, who am I? I am this inner being, and I get to know this inner being that I am to the point where 
I now understand why my thoughts and feelings are going in the direction that they are. Are you with me? So, spiritual intelligence is something that I can discover through the laboratory of my own experience. Yes, there's a certain amount of information that can be shared, but, and there's quite a lot of information actually, but the more I experiment with these ideas, the more I see the results of all of this. And so the beautiful point comes where a situation happens and maybe a week ago there would have been a reaction. Today, just a little bit of understanding and a little bit of practice and I'll say, hold on, I am this being that's shining light and I come to that awareness, it's not just words I'm repeating to myself, but I come to this awareness of this light that I am, this infinitesimal spark of consciousness that I am. And I hold that awareness just for a few moments and the negative cycle of thoughts and feelings stops. Now I'm in that beautiful being that I am and whatever they're saying, whatever they're doing is out there and now I can evaluate it very calmly and what is right, what is useful, I absorb that and respond accordingly and if it's waste, and if it's just negativity being thrown at me, and it is a very negatively charged world that we live in, and most of us are influenced by that to the extent that we've absorbed it a great deal within ourselves, and so our responses are also very much in line with that. And so, Meditation is a very powerful tool to be able to know myself more deeply and change myself to that state of mastery where if I want to maintain my call, if I don't, that's my choice, it's okay, <laughs> carry on. But if I choose to maintain my call, maintain my stability, maintain my inner state of value for myself, I can do that. It's just simply by coming back to the awareness of who I am. It's not a mantra to repeat. It's not a sacred sound that I should invoke and say. It's a fact of understanding and believing and being. And so self -intelli spiritual intelligence is self-knowledge and then further and further actually becoming what I know I can be, being able to open up my own highest potential and come to that state that I would like to attain. And yes, if that's the level I'm working on, then there will be relationships that are challenging, no question about that, of course there will be. But the more I'm able to have a positive, very powerful, pure relationship with myself, that gets translated in my relationships with others also. And if there isn't a relationship with myself, it's going to be very, very difficult maintaining a relationship with anyone else on any level, whether at work or at home in any way. And so usually it's taken as IQ, then EQ, then SQ, but I'm suggesting that a quicker method and more effective method is start with IQ, sorry, start with SQ, 
spiritual intelligence, spiritual quotient, and understanding the self, recognizing the value of others, but also understanding something that we hear about, but I'm not sure how much we deeply understand it, the law of karma, the law of cause and effect. Why are things happening the way they are? And why are they happening to me? This is very often the question, why me? <laughs> but why not you? When it's good things and they happen to me, I don't say, why me? Then I say, wonderful. <laughs> when it's things that are not so good, then I say, well, why me? <laughs> so you can see it's very selective. Just like hearing is selective, seeing is selective. Uh, comprehension is also very selective. But that state of understanding law of karma and understanding why things happen in the way they are is also a very important part of spiritual intelligence. And the more I can get to grips with that also, the more effective I can be in my own life. Effective in terms of managing myself, managing relationships, and making real the things that I would like to happen in my life. So it's a beautiful journey. And the last story, um, how does meditation help IQ? Well, maybe it's not just IQ, maybe it's also um, education on the external level. And I know some sisters who came to the Brahma Kumaris in the 30s who had no um, external education at all. And yet through, they were all given spiritual training, but also where was needed literacy training, basic literacy training. And they became really people who were able to accomplish a huge amount in their life on an external level, not just on an inner spiritual level, but also in their work out there. And so intelligence can also be gained through spirituality. Intelligence in terms of managing things in the world out there. Um, stories about that, but another time. For the moment, you'll have to believe me. <laughs> but yes, it's really true that when I go deeper and deeper into the understanding and the practice of spirituality. And maybe that's another factor that I need to underline, that understanding spirituality is one level, but the practice of spirituality, that awareness, that consciousness, is the more important step. And the more we practice those concepts, those ideas in a real way, like for instance, if before I began my spiritual journey, I'd been asked to speak to three people, I would have found it difficult. Four people and I'd have run away. And things changed overnight when I started my journey. Within a few months, I could speak to people. Why? Because one thing changed. Instead of seeing people, I began to see beings of light. And there was an affinity, a connection, a sense of belonging, not a separation. And so there was no anxiety, no stress. And communication became very natural and easy, whether it was with four, forty or more, didn't matter. Literally, big change. And so have a beautiful journey, a beautiful experience, and some of the things I've talked about might be useful, some think about it and reflect, and maybe they'll be useful sometime in the future. But thank you for joining us, and I don't know whether our MC, yes, he is around. Gom Shanti, thank you very much, Sister Jensi, for your wonderful sharing, as ever. Um, while I was listening to your 
sharing. There's a couple of questions that have came into my mind, especially in this day and age where people are suffering from a lot of emotional distress when there's a bereavement in the family. How does SQ, 